Uh, my name is Jessica Anderson. I'm an historic preservation specialist with the Office of Histor Historic Preservation Scout of City Program. Um, I'm joined today by my supervisor, Dr. Jenny Hay, who's also the Scout of City Program Manager. Um, she'll join us a little later uh, with some information about the research guide we talked about in the description. Um, and then I'm also joined by Lauren Sage. Uh, Jenny and Lauren are largely responsible for organizing um, the calendar for preservation month for OHP. So we are all grateful to them for their work. Um, so uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, you can drop it in the chat in WebEx, or um, if you're joining us through Facebook, uh, you can put it in the comments on Facebook. And Jenny and Lauren are keeping an eye on that and will interrupt me with y'all's questions. So today we are going to cover um, what research tools are available to us online for free. Um, some of them with uh, a San Antonio Public Library card, others just through simple searches. Um, and then also what kind of information you'll be able to find using those tools and then also how our program and office uses what we learn through these research tools to build narratives about properties and neighborhoods in San Antonio. Um, and finally, we'll wrap up by sharing some of the ways that Scout SA can help you learn more about your home or your commercial property through assessment tools and designation. So before we jump in, I wanna share with you a great resource that's available through the public library, which is the genealogy desk. Um, it's located in the Texana room, which is on the top floor of our central library. Um, but you can also reach them at this email since you know not normal times. Um, I don't think they're open yet uh, full time for researchers, but uh, Debbie is typically the person who answers that email and she's incredibly helpful um, and very passionate about doing this kind of research. Um, the library also uh, provides cardholders a number of research tools that are available remotely so that you can research your property from home, but you have to have a library card to log in and access those tools. Um, so if you don't already have a library card, I strongly encourage you to get one. You can actually apply online at mysapl.org and you can just search library card and it'll take you to instructions on how to get a library card remotely. So, my first step in researching an address is always looking for it on a Sanborn fire insurance map. So these maps are detailed maps that were made so that fire insurance companies could assess their total liability in cities. And they provide a ton of great information about properties in San Antonio that were built prior to the mid 1950s. So these years are the ones available online for San Antonio, um, the 1885 through 1911 to 52. Um, but you can also request maps from the 30s from the genealogy desk at that email that I shared previously. Um, so I typically consult Sanborn maps first because they include a lot of information that sort of helps inform how the rest of your search is going to go. Um, they'll contain information about changes to street names and house numbers, which is super common in San Antonio's historic neighborhoods. Um, having an accurate address uh, and identifying changes to addresses over time makes it so much easier to find information about your property. Um, having good search parameters like that are just really integral to having good research results. Um, so the Sanborn insurance maps, fire insurance maps that are available through the library are in black and white, but you can also download color versions of the maps through UT Austin's Perry Castaneda Library. Um, and then you can also request those 30s maps from the genealogy desk, and those are always pro provided in color. Um, so the, the color maps provide really great information about building materials and things like this. We'll discuss that here in a few slides. So how you get started when you're looking through Sanborn Fire Insurance maps for information, um, they're gonna ask you which edition you want, and that's the year from that list of years we showed earlier. Um, each year typically has uh, either one or two volumes for the early years, and then the later sets of maps have five or six volumes available, and they're all broken down into these uh, sort of quadrants. So um, you can see on this map that at the, across the top of the screen, it says volume two. That means if you're looking for properties that are above commerce there, that you would need to go to volume two of the map to find those parcels listed. Um, it includes really 
helpful information like a block number so you can compare that to the legal description of your property um, to make sure that you're looking at the correct street, especially given those kinds of historic street name and house number changes. Um, you also will want to consult, oops, I'm sorry, the key. Um, I think we talk about this later on. So the, the first couple pages of each set of maps, um, each volume of maps has the list of the streets um, and blocks that are available on that map, and then also a key to that map. Um, the keys change uh, between years sometimes. Those are the ones that show uh, what kinds of materials. Um, it's pictured on the bottom of the larger map to the right of your screen. Um, information like materials of, uh, you know, your exterior walls, what kind of roof it had, um, things like this. And that can sometimes change uh, year to year between the Sanborn maps. Um, and then the index is the list of street names. Um, you can see in this screen grab in the bottom left corner that it lists the name of the street and then the house numbers included on each page. Um, so as an example, uh, I want to show you um, these maps from 1912 and 1951 for 241 East French Place. Uh, this was a property that we worked on in 2020. The owner requested landmark designation for it. Um, so on the 20 or the 1912 map, rather, uh, you can see that the house was addressed 308 Indo Street, Y-N-D-O. But by the 1951 map, you can see that the street name changed to East French Place and that the house number shifted to 241. Um, so this is really important information for the next research step, which is looking at city directories. So if you looked up 241 East French Place in a 1911 or 1912 directory, it wouldn't appear because this street was historically Indo Street. Um, and that something like that might lead you to incorrectly assume the house hadn't been built by 1912. Uh, so it's just really good to have this information uh, in your pocket for the next steps of research. I also want to point out that the 1951 map includes um, information about the street being historically called Indo. You'll see it circled in green towards the right of your screen. Um, so even if you land at the 1951 map, information about previous street names might be included there as well. And these two sample maps also provide good information about an addition to the rear of the house at 241 East French Place. So on the 1912 map, you can see the original footprint of the house, but by 1951, there was a small addition to the rear of the house. Um, in this case, because we have a big jump between 1912 and 1951, this is a situation where I would ping Debbie at the genealogy desk and ask for those 30 maps so I can see if I can kind of hone in better on when that addition was constructed. If it appears on one of those maps, I know that it happened that by that year, or if it doesn't appear on those maps, I know that it happened between 1938 and that 1951 map. Um, very occasionally, you might see build dates included on these maps, um, but in my experience, it happens more with commercial structures than with residential properties. So if you're researching a commercial structure or something that used to be a commercial structure, um, you might see the actual date of construction written into the building footprint. Um, I mentioned this earlier, the Maps that are available through the public library online are only in black and white, um, and they provide a ton of good information, but those color maps that you can get through Perry Castaneda um, are really interesting to look at because they show materials information. Just as I said earlier, be sure you use the key that's affiliated with the year and volume that you're looking at to make sure that um, you know, you're interpreting them correctly, because sometimes those uh, keys change between years. So on the left, we see the black and white version of the 1912 map, and then the color version at right. And this is still 241 East French Place. So the key from the second volume of the 1912 color maps shows that the house is constructed of brick, um, and then it had either a composition shingle or a gravel roof. And that's all information that we glean from this key section that's sort of superimposed. Um, I just had a question pop up on my screen, which I honestly did not know was possible in WebEx, but um, the Perry Castaneda uh, maps are available for free. Um, you can actually just search uh, UT Perry Castaneda Sanborn maps, and it'll take you to a directory. You click on S for San Antonio, scroll down. There's a couple other cities, like I think San Angelo and some others are on there. 
Um, so you just scroll down to San Antonio and those color maps are available to anybody. There's, there's no login information required. Um, Dr. Hay just dropped a link into the chat for y'all. Any other questions while, while we're at it? I know I'm going through this incredibly quickly. We have a lot of slides and I wanna make sure to give you guys a good introduction. So don't hesitate to ask if you think of anything while I'm rattling on. Um, so this is a photo of 241 East French Place. I hate talking about properties and not showing you guys what the house actually looks like. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell in this image, which I took from Google Street View, but the house is constructed constructed from brick. So it has like brick cladding on the outside, which was confirmed by that Sanborn map that we looked at previously, the color Sanborn map. So the next research tool I typically consult are the city directories. Um, city directories are basically proto phone books where you can search either by a street name or by a residence name or business name. Um, these directories are available online through the library. Um, you have to search under Heritage Quest. Um, and those are available from 1877 through 1960. Uh, there isn't a directory available for every year, and a lot of them also cover multiple years. So you'll see something like 1910 to 1911 included in a single volume. The Texana Room at the Central Library also has hard copies of those directories for on site use, but of course, those are only available once everything is sort of opened back up to the public for research. There's a little bit of a trick to accessing what I think is the easiest way to navigate the city directories online. So I'm gonna walk you through it really quickly. Um, and just so you guys know, we'll make this presentation available um, afterwards so that you can consult this later. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. Um, so when you go to Heritage Quest through the public library, it's gonna take you to a landing page. And on that landing page, there's like a picture of a guy who to me looks like a property brother. And just to the right of that, you'll see a link to city directories. So when you click on city directories, it's gonna take you to this landing page. Um, you can use this landing page to search for things like a residence name or an address um, by a keyword, which can be like a full address in quotes or a business name. But I find that the, I get better and more accurate results if I browse by year rather than by uh, record affiliated with like a search term. Um, but in order to access that search by year, you kind of have to trick the system. So um, my first step is just typing whatever into keyword search. I mean, just, you know, I literally typed gobbledygook, but you can type a string of letters and hit search. And it's going to take you to this landing page. So you'll get some similar results to this. And in the left nav under search filters at the very bottom, you'll see browse individual records. And you need to click that little triangle next to it to uh, expand the menu there. When you expand the menu, um, it's going to ask you to choose the state, the city or county, and the year that you want to search. Uh, so Texas, San Antonio, and then the year that you want to sort of start on. Um, this is when Sanborns can be helpful. Um, if you know that a property was there in, say, 1904, for example, you can start your search at 1904, get information about maybe who lived there, and work either backwards or forwards to establish sort of a timeline of who lived in your house, maybe who the first resident was um, that way. So you kind of use that information that you gleaned from Sanborn maps for this next step here. When you're in the city directory, you can navigate between the different years using this drop down menu. It's at the top center of the page and it'll allow you to navigate between the different years available for that city. And you can also save copies of what you find for your research files by clicking that green save button in the top right corner and it'll give you the option to save it to your computer. So city directories have a ton of information in them um, that takes a little bit of deciphering because a lot of it's kind of coded. Um, as I said, you can search either by the property address or by a residence name, if you know a residence name. Um, I'm gonna use our uh, one of our other recent designation cases, 1622 West Wiesach, which is uh, pictured in the bottom right corner. Um, this was designated, I think in 2019 or 2018, maybe by now. Um, and, um, if we search just by the address, so we search Huisach and then look for 1622 under Huisach, West Huisach to be specific, uh, we find that Richard N. White was listed as an owner. That's the significance of that circled O next to the name. If we then use that name to look up by last name, um, we can see that his wife name, wife's name was Bess. 
and that their home, which is what that H next to the 1622 denotes, was at 1622 West Huisach. Um, I like to find as many names as I can affiliated with uh, addresses and then search those names in newspaper archives, um, just in case the, the residents may be considered prominent and kind of can help me build a case for designation in this case. Um, whoops, apologies. Um, in this instance, I learned that um, R.N. White was uh, a mayor of San Antonio. He only served for seven months um, from October 54 to April 55, but this helped us establish like a layer of eligibility for this homeowner who wants to designate, who wanted rather to designate his home. Um, something to note is that the, the directories from the late 1800s didn't include listings by street. So if you find a name in a later directory, you might have to work backwards and search those names in the pre-1901 directories to see if they appear along with the address that you're searching. Um, I chose this uh, screen grab from a 1909 city directory because it shows so many examples of these directory codes we mentioned. Um, so at the top, that H, as I said, means homeowner. When you see a number next to one of these listings, it means the number of residents at this address. It could be parents and children. It could be extended family, um, just to give an idea of how many people are there. Um, I always find this especially interesting when we're looking at things like shotgun houses or smaller homes, because um, it's kind of indicative of how much expectations of uh, space at home have changed over time. So sometimes we'll see a shotgun, you know, maybe 400 square feet and there's five or six people living there. Um, I find that really interesting anyways. Um, when a property appears with an R next to it, it means that they're a renter. Um, if it says rear next to the house number, that typically means that person either lives in a detached accessory dwelling, maybe something in the backyard, like a converted garage or an above garage apartment, something like this, or that it's a multifamily property and there's literally like a back door, a rear door that they um, enter to get to their space. Um, if you see a C after a name, that means that that was a black resident of San Antonio. And then vacant is pretty self-explanatory, but still important because it indicates that the property is there, but they didn't get a response as far as who currently occupies it. Searching by last name, um, this is again looking at Mayor White. Um, it can provide some other good information about uh, your property and the people who live there. Um, it can provide information about employers, which could help us establish cases for eligibility. Um, this stuff isn't pictured here, but some other examples are um, if it says WID uh, next to a, a woman's name, followed by a man's name, that denotes that person is widowed. Um, and it's typically listed as if that's her occupation, which is a little unfortunate, but just the reality of the situation. Um, sometimes you can find names of adult children living at the same house. So especially if you're looking by last name, it'll often show like kind of the patriarch or matriarch of the family. And then there'll be other names listed at the same house number and street. Um, and so you know that those people were extended family living in the same home. Um, and you might also occasionally see a house listed or an address rather listed as under construction, which is really helpful for determining build dates because you know it was in the process of being built that year. And addresses can also appear with no response, which means that the surveyor wasn't able to confirm who lived at the address. But again, it confirms that that address did exist at that time. Uh, another really important tool um, when we're building cases or doing assessments for property owners is newspaper research. Um, so OHP, we use uh, something called newspaperarchive.com. It's a subscription service, so it does cost, um, but it's available on site at any public library computer, not just central library, like any of the branches. Um, and it allows us to search papers from all over the world. And you can search by keyword, um, by city. You can actually search also by individual newspaper. Um, Locally, it includes the Express News, the Light, La Prensa, and also the German language paper, which I will not attempt to pronounce because I don't speak German. Um, but even if you don't speak Spanish or German, these, paper, these papers are really helpful because they can provide photos of buildings, photos of people who might have lived on your property or um, had a business at your property. So don't discount them just because you don't speak that language. Um, SAPL also has Newspaper Source Plus available in their databases, very similar to Newspaper Archive in that you can search through uh, papers by keyword. Um, Express News Online is can be helpful for more recent history, 
Um, I always kind of search there if I'm not coming up with, you know, good results elsewhere. Um, but again, just mostly good for a more recent history. The portal to Texas history has the Express News, but it also has the San Antonio Register, which was the African American newspaper that operated in San Antonio. Um, and then the Institute for Texan Cultures has the San Antonio Light photo collection. Again, really helpful for finding uh, pictures of maybe historical figures who uh, lived at or worked at your property um, and anything that might appear in, in the newspapers. Maybe you wanna look for a more clear version of something that you find through your newspaper research. So um, let me give you a few examples of the kinds of stuff you might find when you're doing newspaper research. So this is an example of a commercial building that we did an assessment on for the property owner. It's at 126 or 120 rather Guadalupe. And um, we lucked out and found this picture of the building, which was built um, circa 1924. And it gives us some really good information about the business done at this location, which can, which can help build a um, in case, uh, I'm sorry, help build a case for eligibility um, if they were to choose designation for the property. Um, and when we compare it to a recent photo of the structure, you can see how little has changed since the property was built. We can compare those fenestration patterns. Um, it's a little difficult to see maybe on your screen, but even the parapet of the building has remained the same. The vents are in the same location. Um, so we can see that this building also has a pretty high level of integrity. There hasn't been a lot of changes to the exterior of the building since the photo was published in 1927. Um, sometimes photos in newspapers help us identify changes to the original structure. So this was a property, I think this was actually the first property that I helped uh, move through designation, 843 Rigsby, which is in Highland Park. Um, this is an example of an Asian influenced craftsman home. Um, and the historic photo and then comparing it with a current photo of the property helped us learn that there used to be a pergola that extended from the house over the driveway, kind of creating a little bit of a carport um, over the entry. But we only have those piers remaining today. Um, this is something also that could help an owner because if they decided they wanted to restore this pergola condition, they have this historic photo um, that can help inform their plans um, and also help it move through the design review process a little bit easier because we know it's an historic condition at the home. Newspaper research uh, can also help you glean information about neighborhood context. Um, this is a good example from Green Lawn Estates, a uh, local historic district uh, designated ooh, in 2017 or 2018. Um, and this advertisement appeared in 1927. It has this nice rendering uh, just below the title of one of the homes included in the, in the neighborhood. And it also has this map and some helpful language about the, the neighborhood. So, in addition to that rendering, we learned the name of the company that developed Green Lawn, which was the Miller Darrow Company, the boundaries of the estates, and neighborhood covenants, which in this case are sort of worded to protect investors from neighboring structures that would detract from the value of their property. This kind of language we see often, um, they're sort of maybe now considered restrictive covenants, but you'll see language about how much a person might need to spend on a house in order to. Um, build there and things like this. And a lot of times you can find that information in these advertisements for individual parcels or entire neighborhoods like we have here. But even if you don't find photos or helpful diagrams about the property that you're researching, you can still find really important information about your property. Um, so we uh, helped an owner designate 215 Lowell. And uh, the newspaper research showed that a man named Henry Shanefeld bought these lots on Lowell Street from Hunstock, who, uh, if you're familiar with San Antonio development history, might sound familiar. Um, and our Sandburg map research helped us confirm that 215 Lowell was one of the lots listed in this second clip that shows the lot numbers and the block number. Um, and then searching Mr. Shanefield's name led us to information about a trade school that he started around 1903. Um, and then also this article describing a fall that Mr. Shanefield suffered while working on a house on Lowell Street. And finally, we found Mr. Shanefeld's obituary. Um, so this was published just a few days after the news of his fall from the previous slide. And in his obituary, we learned that he was a German immigrant who worked in Austin before coming to San Antonio. Um, he actually helped build the state capitol and then also the Driscoll Hotel in Austin. Um, the obituary, obituary's headline describes him as a well-known contractor. 
because Shanefeld owned the lots on which both 215 and 217 next door, um, we know he owned those, those lots. The series of articles showed us that Shanefeld was a regionally respected builder, that he built these two twin properties. So 215 and 217 Lowell have sort of the same footprint and same design. Uh, and that Mr. Shanefeld died from injuries sustained while working on one of the properties. And these are all things that help us build um, kind of a more robust narrative about why this house was important and worth designating. Um, so another tool that we use often um, is findagrave.com. Uh, there's another website called billiongraves.com that we sometimes use if we don't find what we're looking for through find a grave. But um, find a grave has a lot of helpful genealogy related items. Um, it helps you find and confirm family members for somebody that you're researching. Sometimes has links to obituaries that you aren't able to find through normal newspaper research. Um, I'm going to use Mayor White again as an example. Uh, we know his first and last name and his middle initial from the research that we already did. We saw that full listing in the city directory. Um, we know his year of death from finding his obituary. Um, in the, the state information, I always search by Texas just to kind of increase likelihood of a search result. We get this one search result for Richard Naylor White. And this is what you get when you click on his name. So this is useful because it can confirm birth and death dates. Um, here we also get information about his wife and children, um, though that's not necessarily something you're gonna find affiliated with everybody. Um, as I mentioned, your search might result in obituaries. Um, I've found family photos uh, and information about where somebody was born. Oftentimes if someone emigrated to the US, um, next to birth, it will show not only their date of birth, but also where they were born. Um, but a lot of this information is crowdsourced. So what you find depends on what was submitted by the public. Um, there is also a cache of historic maps available online through a quick search. Um, they're mostly helpful for uh, searches within the original 36 square miles of San Antonio, but our office also uses them to look for information about historic ranches outside of but that 36 square miles. Um, there are bird's eye maps available online from 1873, 1886, 1891, um, and those are available through the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth. Um, again, uh, just accessible through a search. You don't have to have any um, login credentials or a, a card or anything like that. And then there are 1909 and 1929 street maps of San Antonio available just by searching 1909 or 1929 San Antonio street map. Um, there's also a 24 street map through the Library of Congress. Um, that map includes historic neighborhood names as well, which can be helpful if you choose to do deed and plat research, which we'll discuss in a few slides. There are also some city maps that uh, can be helpful in your research. So the one stop map, again, accessible by just searching one stop map San Antonio has zoning information, um, both uh, base zoning and overlays like historic designation. Uh, if it's included in an historic district, you can also search for a neighborhood association and city council district there and then. Um, we also, uh, last year, the year before, launched the OHB Explorer map, which is a way that you can search recent uh, certificates of appropriateness, which are CFAs. Um, this is a review process or the result of a re review process for designated structures in San Antonio, and it can help you establish dates of more recent modifications and additions to properties um, because it'll allow you to search for that owner's request from OHP to review and approve that scope of work. We um, also often use historic aerial photography. This uh, set of maps is available for free at historicaerials.com and it covers sort of intermittent years between 1955 and 2016. It's really helpful to for determining dates of modifications to structures and also uh, changes to neighborhood context that aren't covered by the Sanborn maps. So the Sanborn maps end in 1952 and then historic aerials pick up at 1955. Um, they have a really nice compare tool that you can use where it'll give you a slider to have, you know, like 1955 on one side of the screen and a later year on the other side of the screen so you can compare additions or modifications to the footprint of a property really easily right in the app. Um, and it is free. The free version has these watermarks on it, but it's 
it's pretty navigable uh, regardless. Um, and as an example of how to use or how we use historic aerials, um, so uh, you guys may realize that this is the 100 year anniversary of the 1921 San Antonio floods. Um, after the 1921 floods, there were actually a number of, of subsequent floods um, in the 50s and 60s that resulted in some pretty drastic uh, flood mitigation measures along creeks in the historic west side of San Antonio. So if we look at these neighborhoods in uh, on the west side, you can see how many properties were impacted by these flood mitigation measures. So here's uh, pre mitigation measures. You can see the creek running in this sort of Y pattern um, among the houses. And then after the mitigation measures, you can see how many properties were impacted. Um, there's a lot of a loss of residential properties there. So, um, one of the sort of more, I don't know, hardcore research options that we use is Dean and Platt research, which is available through um, the Bear County clerk. So here you can search for deeds or plats by name, by address, legal description, and more. Um, it often results, or not often, sometimes you can find the names of first or early renters or owners um, and subsequent owners of the property. Um, Sometimes you can find who built the property. You might see like a lumber company listed. Very occasionally you might see an architect listed um, and also information about who platted or replatted the neighborhood. Um, and searching the address at bcad.org is a good place to start. Um, on bcad, the very last section is uh, information about deeds and it'll list up to three of the most recent deed transfers related to that address. So that can be helpful in determining, um, you know, maybe a name that you can start searching or a document ID that you can search um, to help you in your deed and plat research. And when all else fails, um, I Google things. I Google addresses, um, names that have, I've come across in my research and um, you might, oops, I'm sorry. You uh, might stumble across articles from other cities or states or countries. Um, when I'm using newspaper archive, I often only search in San Antonio. So my results might not capture some of this stuff that I find through a general uh, Google search. Um, sometimes you come across family specific genealogy websites. I'll say this is especially common for some of the like uh, first settlers um, in like Castroville or San Antonio, for example. Um, It'll also sometimes come up with portal to Texas history uh, searches that I might not, not have thought of. Um, you can also look through the Institute of Texan, Texan Cultures website. Um, because of ITC's charge, it's done a good job focusing on sort of ethnic histories of Texas. Um, and it's one of the few places you're going to find uh, accessible and curated information that's specific to immigrant or marginalized groups in San Antonio. Um, and that you might also just sit, hit some other search results that create leads you can confirm using those other tools that we've discussed today. Um, so just to manage expectations a little bit, um, the tools that we discussed, they're not always going to help you determine an exact year of construction, an architect or a builder, um, you know, the, who the house was built for, um, or a home's first resident. And a lot of that to do is to do with um, these factors that impact that availability. So things like when was the home built? Um, if it was built, you know, prior to the first Sanborn map available, it might not be something that's easily accessible. Um, if it was built outside the city limits, um, when it was built, if it was built for someone who was, uh, you know, more working class or not somebody of a prominent family or prominent name. Um, and also things that are sort of uh, contractor built or not built by a prominent architect or a builder of record. Um, you know, if you're living in an Atlee Ayers house, chances are your house might be better documented than someone who lives in, you know, a Sears kit home in Tobin Hill or something like this. So Scott is saying uses these tools uh, to build cases for designation, which I've mentioned often today, um, to research homes for which demolition is requested. Um, I failed to mention this early on, but uh, Scout SA is uh, the designation and demolitions review arm of the Office of Historic Preservation and OHP reviews every demolition um, requested in the city. So this, these are the same tools that we use uh, when we're evaluating those for eligibility for a designation. 
Um, these tools are also used when we do historic assessments and requests for review of contributing status, uh, which is typically tools used by property owners who are exploring selling a property or perhaps demolishing something um, in preparation for sale. Uh, we work with them to determine how the HDRC might react um, were they to receive a request for demolition of those properties. Um, and just kind of more larger scope, pulling away a bit, uh, these tools help us determine which, if any, of these 16 criteria a property meets under the UDC. Um, so UDC 35607B is the code that we use to determine eligibility for both individual landmarks and for local historic district designation. Generally speaking, those criteria fall into these buckets. So they're what you expect, affiliation with a prominent person, uh, or a prominent event, if it's uh, a particularly good example of an architectural style or construction methods, um, if there's a relationship to other properties nearby, if there's cultural significance affiliated with the property or archeological significance. Um, these criteria are based on the Secretary of Interior's uh, standards for national register listing, but they're written through the lens of San Antonio history. And our research also helps our colleagues in design review. Um, it helps us, our office build its knowledge of neighborhood histories, and it also lays a groundwork for design review to review scopes of work on landmarks or in historic districts. Um, and one of the ways is, you know, it can help them assess impact of modifications to original footprint, um, changes to materials, or later additions of materials changes. Just kind of help, helps them establish what might be in historic condition versus uh, a more recent modification to the house. So, um, we, uh, or Jenny rather, I should say, Dr. Hay has been working on a brand new tool for our citizen historians, um, an interactive research guide uh, using ArcGIS Story Map. Um, so, Jenny, do you wanna take over and give us a, an introduction to what you've been working on? Sure do. I'm going to share my screen just briefly. Just a second here. Okay, so what you're seeing is um, our prototype story map, which is a, um, a guide for researchers who are specifically doing um, uh, some kind of an archival uh, research project on properties here in San Antonio, uh, largely residential. So um, uh, we've tried to de design something that um, you could use if you were uh, trying to research a commercial structure, um, or even if you were trying to research properties that were outside of San Antonio. Um, uh, many of the resources that we're going to share with you that, that uh, Jessica shared with you earlier are obviously um, available and applicable to uh, properties that are outside of just San Antonio, whether it's in the um, central Texas region, in Texas in general, even out of state. So um, uh, what we're building out and what we're excited to kind of uh, share that this is this is going to be a resource for everyone is essentially a, um, a set of uh, guides to carry you through determining specific information, answering specific questions about um, a historic property. So um, in each section, we provide um, extensive links uh, to the resources that just just went over with you, um, uh, and um, we'll provide some direction on how to um, how to use those. So, just for instance, this first section, we try to help you determine who is involved with a property, who a property. Um, uh, might have been associated with historically, um, whether it's the original owner, the builder, um, the, the architect, um, folks who lived in the property later, um, uh, to give you a better idea of sort of the human side of the history of a property. Um, and then we help you determine um, what the architectural style of that property is. And um, we actually have a training already uh, done specifically about San Antonio architectural styles. So we've got um, a little bit of uh, video here to, to help um, guide you through that investigation. Um, uh, obviously, one of the, the first questions that we get asked when um, we're determining uh, the potential significance of a property is how old it is. And so we've got some information that we're building out here for how to determine the specific age of a structure. Um, and then finally, um, uh, we are linking to uh, maps that are available um, 
uh, including those Sanborn fire insurance maps that uh, Jess showed earlier that can help you really see the original footprint of a structure, or even um, in some cases, uh, a sort of bird's eye view, depending on how old the structure is of what it would have looked like. So um, the idea is that this is gonna be available during preservation month. So we'll, uh, everybody who signed up today will get a link to it when it's ready and we'll um, add some research examples, kind of like the ones that Jess just went through today um, to provide some uh, specific um, examples of what what you might find um, as you're looking and uh, enjoy some of the successes that we've had learn a little bit about some of the properties that we've researched um, over time uh, here. So I think that that is all that I've got for um, our story map. Um, so uh, it'll be available this month. Uh, what you're looking at now is obviously a, an outline in draft form. Um, but we'll, yeah, we'll send a, a link to everybody and obviously we'll also be promoting it um, on our social media too. So um, you guys can find it there and uh, yeah, I'll hand it back over to Jess, who's going to talk a little bit about how you might use that um, resource um, in your own, in your own projects. Right. There it goes. Right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so another really exciting development, um, we launched just last fall um, a community source storytelling project called There's a Story Here. Um, it's a sticker and sign campaign that crowdsources stories about places special to San Antonians. Um, the goal is to celebrate fun, obscure, meaningful, and particularly previously untold stories by highlighting the locations that are tied to the stories. Um, it has an interactive map, and we're really asking for a lot of public engagement with this project. Um, the stories that we want to collect, they don't have to be the first something that happened, the last something that happened, the best something that happened. Um, those are welcome, but uh, I think what we're really looking for are sort of family stories, urban legends, um, or anything that you think would interest people passing by that location. Um, something that was really important to us was that there, that it was open to all different kinds of stories. So there's no age requirement. It doesn't have to be 25 or 50 years old to be added to the map. Um, recent history is more than welcomed. Um, the point of it is to kind of share undertold stories from the city uh, with your neighbors, with people visiting San Antonio. Um, so the website to submit a story is essaypreservation.com slash Tash. So once you gather information about whatever property you're researching, I hope that you'll deposit some of it here to share with the public. Um, let me show you the website real quick. So when you navigate to essaypreservation.com slash Tash, it's gonna take you to the discovery map survey. Um, this is the same survey that Jenny uses to collect information for the Scott Essay Discovery Map. Um, so it's going to ask what your story is about. Um, you can geolocate your story just using the address here. Um, if there's not a solid address listed, you can also use coordinates if you're into that. Um, and then you can share your story uh, here in this um, box right here. They're going to ask why it's important to you, if it's affiliated with a particular identity, um, there's really cool options to include audio files. So if you want to interview a friend or a family member about the place or event or person that you want added to the map, you can upload that audio file there. Um, you can also upload an image related to your story. Um, the most important thing though, is that if you want to participate and there's a story here, you have to click yes under send me a story here marker. You need to include contact information, um, your email address, and phone number is ideal. One of them is just fine, though. And then we have two different marker types. Um, there's a vinyl sticker that you can uh, adhere to a property or something on the property as long as you have the owner's permission or you are the owner of the property. Um, there's also a sign if the owner of the property doesn't want a sticker attached on a window um, or uh, to put in the right of way if um, the, the story you want to highlight is in a public space. Um, and then permission to display the story, which is also really important because um, on the map, I'll leave without saving my results. There are markers for each of the stories submitted to there's a story here. 
Pardon me while I should have preloaded this for you guys, I apologize. So each one of these markers is a story submitted by a member of the public. So here, this is a story about 502 East Gunther um, that was the studio to photographer Ernest Raba. And apparently, O. Henry attended events there, a gathering place for an art club helped establish in 1895. Here across the street, we have 503 East Gunther that was a speakeasy during prohibition. Um, I know that there are some stories on here too about, for example, the REM music video that was filmed here in town. Um, here's one about Teddy Roosevelt and the Manger Hotel bar. Um, so we really wanna hear any stories that you think should be shared on the map that other people might be interested in knowing about. Submit it, submit your photos and audio files if you have them, and um, hopefully we'll get a lot of good stories on there. Um, so how Scott O'Say can help you guys in your uh, property research, um, we can help you uh, designate your property if you wish. Um, designations in the city of San Antonio are always free. Um, Jenny and I are your case managers for those requests. So if you have any questions about designation in San Antonio, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we will also uh, check our files to see if we have anything already pulled for a certain address. Um, we can do that for free. Um, and then we also offer uh, historic assessment tools. Um, not to get too into the weeds on that, but um, you know, if you're interested in, in the history of your property, you can contact us to see if you're eligible for an assessment. Again, those are typically reserved for people who are considering maybe selling a property or maybe demolishing a property. Um, so, but you can shoot us a line or give me a call and I'm glad to, to help you uh, figure out whether or not you're eligible for that tool. And that is all I have for you today. Um, this is contact information for me and Jenny. If you have any questions about um, what we shared with you today or any questions about your property research, I'm glad to help. Um, and Jenny, Lauren, do we have any questions in the chat or in the Facebook comments? No, I think we've been able to answer all of them. Looks like we've got one more. Um, is there a partnership between OHP or Bear County or other municipalities for Scout SA? So, um, so we definitely coordinate with with Bear County and all of our programs um, uh, wherever we can. And um, Jess, I don't know how explicit the Tash conversation has been with the county, but I know um, we've been working with the county over uh, Preservation Month to. Um, to be sure that we're sort of coordinating all of our, um, our events together and making sure we're sharing resources. So, um, so yeah, in that, in that regard, there has been, um, uh, you know, some sort of a, a less formal kind of partnership in that regard. So, um, yeah, I don't see any other questions that we have. Um, I do want to say that I really appreciate everybody being here today and um, as always a spectacular job, Jess. Uh, this is the kind of work that we we get to do um, a lot as we do quite a bit of research, but it's not always um, as fun as it is getting to share it with you guys. So thanks. Thanks for tuning in. We'll um, we'll be uh, sharing this recording. Um, so if you want to come back to it, if there's something there that you wanted to see um uh feel free to either check facebook or um uh, we'll also have it on the scout sa website um i also will say that uh we will email i th think we mentioned this earlier we will email everybody a link when the research guide is ready so that you can access those um uh, those resources directly um, and start your own project anything else you want to say to conclude jess Somebody just commented that they're going to explore Tash um, as a more local tour guide. And one of the things that we envision for the future is people um, using these stories to create um, personally curated tours of the city as well. So keep that in mind as you're, you're considering things to include on that map. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited that you guys are excited about it. Yeah, there was one more question in the chat too. Um, are TASH submissions curated or moderated by OHP? Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that any, Jess, but um, sure. 
you want to answer? So yeah. They are only curated to the extent that um, if there's something that we think is maybe questionable or insensitive, particularly, um, we may choose to remove them from the map. But the idea is that it's a crowdsource initiative. So we really want a broad range of stories represented there. If it's a story that's specific to your family, we want to see that. If it's a story that you think is impactful to the history or development of San Antonio um, as a whole, we want to see that as well. Um, we do want in future to curate some stories, like I said, for these kind of walking tours or driving tours. Um, and we're also in working on a partnership with uh, TPR where we choose stories submitted to the map to highlight at length um, for a web series. There's been one episode of it so far, um, and so we're working on episode two right now. Um, but if you have any questions about that, if there's a story that you want to pitch for both Tash and the TPR series, um, Jenny just dropped my email in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear from you or submit it on the map. And when you submit something and you click that Tash box, I and my colleague, Rachel, who's working on Tash with me, we get notified. So we'll know that you added it and it'll be on our radar for, for that TPR partnership as well. Excellent. Okay, well, um, y'all know how to reach us. If you think of anything else, please feel free to to reach out. And um, with that, I guess I'll I'll let us conclude. Thank you so much, everyone.